Hello there, friends and neighbors. This is me, Stella Hendricks. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel again. Surprise! I said that I was gonna miss this week because uh, I just got back from Idaho and I'm gonna be going down to Las Vegas. I'm very spoiled. <laughs> I'm going on all of these wonderful vacations. It's a beautiful time of year and I'm blessed to have family members uh, all around to go and visit. So. That was very fun. I thought that I was gonna miss this week because I would be so busy jet setting across the universe, but I made it back on time and I marked up this wonderful vintage Playboy for us to make a video and enjoy before I head off to Las Vegas. This one is April, 1977. And the hidden bunny, I always forget to show you guys the hidden bunny, oh my gosh. But on this one, it's up here on her cap. Can you see? And part of me totally loves this cover. I love the pose. I love the old timey underwear. I love this old couch that she's on. Um, but it's this, this feature is Girls of the New South. And so for Girls of the New South, they decided to put this girl in a Confederate cap. Uh, I think that's a very uh, old stereotype about the South that uh, we can get rid of, although this was 1977, even by then, you know, it was a bit of a stereotype. And this is the new self. That's like the symbol of the old self. This is the like, guy, Playboy, what are you doing to me? Crazy times. So, let's dive right in. Now I'm gonna do a lot of reading in this one. Sometimes I'm very superficial and sometimes I get really caught up in the articles and stuff. This time there will be lots of reading to do. Uh, so this is from uh, Dear Playboy. It is fascinating to observe that many individuals in our society who manage to kick the cultural habit of authoritarian religious belief seem ever so eager to replace it with some new authoritarian belief system such as this. The ever-growing guru and disciple movement continues to support my own modestly proposed basic rule of human behavior. The more ridiculous a belief system, the higher probability of its success. <laughs> I find that very funny. Uh, I think it's easy for all of us to look at anyone else's beliefs and think that they're so ridiculous. Uh, growing up Mormon, uh, a lot of people know the ridiculous Mormon stories about an angel coming down from heaven and showing Joseph Smith where the golden plates were buried so that he could translate them and restore the Church of Jesus Christ. What? Angels? Golden plates? This is crazy. But when you compare that to stories about, you know, Moses or really a lot of other religious stories, it really is only maybe as ridiculous as everything else is. So, <laughs> but I do think it's very interesting. A lot of people, a lot of my fellow ex-Mormons um, have become very hardcore leftist. I respect, you know, political beliefs of all different sides. I myself am a libertarian, so <laughs> I tend to agree and disagree with everybody. But uh, I, I, th I found that very interesting that uh, the church is this very strong authoritarian figure and uh, people who are socialists tend to want that very strong authoritarian figure. That's essentially what a socialist government is. It kind of runs your life. And it seems so strange to me that they would uh, abandon, you know, one controlling religion for what I perceive to be another, but it's very common. Um, I think people do... A lot of people do naturally look for a leader, a, a father figure, maybe a mother figure in some cases that uh, you feel safe when you have, you know, a big, strong, you know, I guess we'll call it a daddy figure to tell you that everything's going to be all right and this is this and that is that. It's kind of hard to become that figure to yourself. That's something I really had to learn to do when I left the Mormon church was really decide what do I believe and why do I believe it? Um, it was almost like exercising a muscle that hadn't really been exercised before. I'm rather good at that nowadays. <laughs> but when I first left, um, I think I did, I did very much want somebody to tell me uh, what was what. 
I guess I was just used to it. Maybe that's a big part of it. You're just, you're used to it. You don't realize you're, what you're doing. You're just doing what you've always done. Hmm. Interesting. Anyway. Ugh, pardon me sniffing, you guys. I have terrible allergies. Ugh, I'm always so embarrassed, but what can we do? All right, so this is also from Dear Playboy. Playboy does a good job of combating the puritanical repression of sexual feeling and behavior, and in some respects, it seems to take seriously the responsibility of protecting sexual and other important freedoms. So I'm puzzled that you apparently don't realize that features such as Touch Me, Feel Me, Spank Me from the January issue of Playboy by Rosemary Santini contribute to the antithesis of freedom, which is inherent in rape and other forms of violence by men towards women. As a therapist, I see women who have been subjected to rape and beatings and who do not view their victimization as fun, exciting, or sexually stimulating. There are a lot of men out there who are eager to be persuaded that their women want nothing more than to be brutalized, and this article helps them believe it. Men will not be sexually free until women are. Playboy could be an important social force if it carried out its philosophy in its own pages rather than exploit the antithesis of free man and free woman. This is Ginny Crow from Seattle, Washington. Uh, Joe Corman says, Touch me, feel me, spank me is most revealing. It's always fascinating to me to find out what the opposite sex really wants, though I'm not sure the Santini piece really represents the average woman. I think that's really important. I am quite sure that there are people out there who enjoy all kinds of sexual play and sexual kinks and more power to them, that's the greatest. But the more outlandish or the more specific, probably the more rare that's going to be. And it's probably going to be that the average woman doesn't enjoy, oh, sorry, doesn't enjoy um, those kinds of uh, extreme forms of sexual play. Um, I think this is one reason I am in favor of uh, sex work is because sex workers uh, can be that outlet for those desires that perhaps your partner is not into, but you know, you really want to explore and people who are sex workers are generally more uh, diverse, <laughs> shall we say, in their proclivities. Is that a right word? We're going to say it is. So while I don't want to say anything, I think they're referring to BDSM here probably. Um, so I, there's nothing against that and it's, it's entirely possible that your partner would enjoy it. But I think the real key here is to listen to your partner. And if they want to explore something, go ahead and explore it together. And maybe it turns out they didn't realize how much they would like it, but it's entirely possible that they are not going to be into it. I have nothing against it myself, but there's a lot of stuff, not a lot of stuff. There's a few things that people think of as pretty like mainstream sexual play and sexual activity that I have nothing against, but I myself have 0, 0.0.00 interest in participating in. I have explored it. I have tried a couple different things. I'm always trying to be open-minded, but if it's not for you, it's not for you. And don't let people bully you into thinking you're a prude because you're not into some particular thing. It's That's just not true. So. I have not read that particular article. I will have to get a hold of that magazine and I'll tell you what I think about it. Playboy after hours. Her a lot doesn't sound vacant to us. <laughs> the Victoria, Texas Armadillo Confab and Exposition. <laughs> the what? <laughs> An annual gala of unusual events, greased body sliding, belch offs, beer can smashing, first chronicled in these pages in November 1973, oh, we'll have to get that one, offers participants the chance to compete for the title of Miss Vacant Lot. This year's winner, a five foot five, 215 pound beautician, managed to stuff 200 pop top tabs down her size 36 triple E bikini while warbling, keep your fingers out of it. It don't belong to you. <laughs> okay, are you guys familiar with Chelsea Lynn, AKA 
uh, Trailer Trash Tammy. Is it Trailer Park Tammy? I think it's Trailer Trash Tammy. That's what I wrote down here, I think. I can't really read my own handwriting. But she is hilarious. She is a comedian and uh, she does all of these like kind of self-roasting, uh, American white trash stereotype roasting uh, uh, photo shoots and articles and events and she is delightful. Recently she actually did some really like, like legit straight sexy um, photo shoots and it was amazing how gorgeous she was because she always like plays up that horrible like, trailer park look. <laughs> So it was incredible to see how gorgeous she cleans up too, but uh, she's just the most hilarious thing. Chelsea Lynn, uh, Trailer Trash Tammy, definitely check her out. She is a riot. She is a laugh riot, and it sounds very much like she would win the title of Miss Vacant Lot. I bet she would do great. <laughs> oh, I marked something else here. Oh, a Broadway stripper has devised a successful way of dealing with persistent customers. When someone, request, when someone requests her phone number, this enterprising lady readily gives them one, that of the local pest control company. Okay, that is hysterical. And this is a problem that all of us strippers have at one point or another in our lives. When I was working uh, in, at any of the strip clubs I was working at, I happened to notice that it was very difficult to finagle and to charm $20 bills out of these guys. And they, they know, right? You're at the strip club and this is a stripper. She's here working. She wants your money. If you want to hang out with her or get dances from her or any of these things, you should give this bitch so money. Man, 20s, they were real tight on, but phone numbers, they were stuffing their phone numbers down my bra and into my purse and throwing them at me as I was walking out the door. Phone numbers, they were real generous with. 20s, they were kind of stiff on. Idiots. <laughs> so I understand the travails of this poor Broadway stripper. Which is probably more like burlesque back in the day since the 70s stripping. I don't know, I think this is kind of like when our modern version of stripping started to come to be like late 70s, early 80s. But I love the burlesque even more than the stripping. So, music, Playboy music. In the combustible algam, Amalgam, that's the word, in the combustible amalgam of talents that was the Beatles, it was always clear that Paul McCartney was the mop top with the commercial instincts that struck for the jugular. In the early days, it was Paul who pushed them into coordinated jackets and predictably, it is Paul who has achieved the greatest commercial post Beatles success. With the release of Wings Over America by Capitol Records, a three rec record document of the Wings show that sold out every city it played last year, the reason for that success is put into clear perspective. Wings exudes the concept of professional entertainment that has, been char that has characterized McCartney from the beginning, and it's playing here perfect for the silly love songs with which Paul tickles our fancy. Ah, I love Wings. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, uh, we didn't really listen to a lot of uh, secular music, a lot of modern music, but uh, there was a lot of 70s bands that we listened to. For some reason, my parents really weren't into the Beatles very much, but they had uh, a couple albums of Wings. So I grew up knowing uh, Paul McCartney from Wings, and then only later I heard that name again with the Beatles. <laughs> My family was pretty uh, restrictive. I grew up uh, pretty sheltered. I didn't really know about a lot of outside influences. In fact, uh, it wasn't until I was uh, stripping down in Vegas at Glitter Gulch, my alma mater, that one of the girls was uh, talking to me about you know music that she danced to. And we were talking about different bands and stuff. A lot of them I'd never heard of before. And she talked about a band called Nirvana. And I listened to their music and I thought, oh, I really like this, this is great. And so I went on iTunes or whatever to look up more of their music. And I was so sad to discover that they didn't have a lot of music because Kurt Cobain is one of the, is he the 27 Club? I'm pretty sure he is. 
but he died really young and so he can't make any more music. And I was just finding out about all this, you know, when I was down in Las Vegas, gosh, what was that? Like, I don't know, probably about 2011, 12? I'm not even, I'm really bad with telling uh, time. I can remember things, but timelines, they kind of evade me. Anyway, I was down there and I was talking to one of the other strippers one night when we're all sitting there. You do a lot of talking to the other girls when you're down there. When it's slow, you just sit and chain smoke cigarettes and talk to each other. And I was telling her how sad I was to find out that Kurt Cobain had died early and there wasn't any more Nirvana music. And everyone's looking at me like, girl, that happened in the 90s. But I just found out about it. So it was news to me. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Anyway, so yeah, that's how I, I knew wings. I love wings. I've always been a big fan. I'll show you the artwork here. There we go. All right. What's next? What's next? Oh, <laughs> as usual, we just have to stop and look at the Marlboro ad. Okay, this is hysterical. A carving set? Was there, apparently there is, a point in time when Marlboro just started selling kind of Western accoutrement. Uh, I remember a couple episodes ago, we were going through one and it had a fold out, almost little mini catalog of all these different things, knives and I don't know, pipes. I think they had like some tack and leatherware in there. And I thought, this is hysterical that this is all coming from a cigarette company. Of course, down here, you see now they have the Surgeon General's warning. So maybe people are starting to back off and the companies are starting to panic and figure out how else they can draw the customers in because it doesn't have, you know, back in the 50s. And I think even before that, doctors used to advise people to smoke because they said it made your lungs stronger. Uh, King George, the whatever, the father of the current Queen of England, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, uh, he had a stutter pretty famously and one of the things that doctors advised him to do was to smoke a bunch of cigarettes Because they thought it would improve his constitution or improve his lungs or something And he ended up dying pretty early from lung cancer because he was a chain smoker And it's just incredible to me that doctors, you know advised that so I think it's very healthy to always have a little dose of skepticism even when the professionals or whoever is saying you know this is in the clear you know it's amazing what science can uncover as it continues on Whoop, there we go okay the playboy forum a continuing dialogue on contemporary issues between playboy and its readers the best and the brightest for years, I have insisted to all and sundry that the brightest women are the sexiest. My friends have told me I'm wrong, but now I have found a scientific study that backs me up all the way. According to Dr. Matthias v Wenderlein of the University of Ergil in Germany, uh, quoted, the San quoted in the San Francisco Chronicle, the more intelligent a gal is, the better her sex life. While the dumber she is, the more likely she is to suffer from frigidity, inhibitions, and sexual disturbances. Dr. Wenderlein based this on several studies of groups of women, each group numbering 400 over a period of years. If this is true, why is it so that so many men believe the so-called dumb blondes make the best lays? I'll tell you why. It's because most men are dumb themselves. Bright men have always known the truth, even before Dr. Wenderlein's studies the clots think they're having a great time with their cloddish female counterparts, but they have no idea how great sex can be with a really intelligent and imaginative partner. This is James Scott from Los Angeles, California. Well, I think that there might be something to that. I think that really sex is probably best when it's a matching of minds, probably when it's someone who you find particularly interesting. And you know, there's lots of different types of intelligence. Uh, my sister is terribly book smart. Um, I'm very emotionally intelligent. Uh, some people can solve you know, all these crazy math equations and they forget to tie their shoes. 
There's a lot of different kinds of smart, and I think it's just important that you find a smart that matches you. Also, if this is true, why do, why do so many men believe that so-called dumb blondes always make the best lay? Well, maybe because blondes are like most other types of people, and there are smart ones, and there are dumb ones, and there are pretty ones, and there are ugly ones, and there are thin ones, and there are fat ones, and blondes just tend to have this aura about them that they're sexy wherever that particularly came from but that's so it's blondes aren't all dumb therefore the idea of blondes being the sexiest doesn't correlate to the idea of them being dumb i think that uh pink the artist pink uh had a quote to uh, quasi recently saying that sexy and smart are not oil and water you don't have to dumb yourself down to be cute and i absolutely believe that I think it's fine to uh, like kind of play dumb in a flirty way like Marilyn Monroe talks about in uh, uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, but it's just ridiculous to imagine that any person, you know, people with blue eyes or people with brown hair or people with freckles, you know, they're all dumb or all this. That's such a collectivist idea, you know, guys, let's, let's be individuals here. <laughs> Crazy. Okay, I told you I was doing a lot of reading today. <laughs> it's probably because I was in the, the car for 13 hours driving up to Coeur d'Alene reading this, so. Okay, the right to sex. It seems to me that Coyote, it's uh, an acronym, and other organizations and individuals pushing the decriminalization of prostitution are unaware of the most legitimate reason for prostitution. They all mention a woman's right to, right to do as she wishes with her body and the victimless nature of the crime of prostitution. But I have never heard any of them mention that the fact that every human being should have the right to sex when he or she needs it. Obviously, many people, the physically unattractive, those who do not know how to relate to the opposite sex and others, cannot have sex unless they buy it, and in many cases, anti-prostitution laws deny those people their rights to relieve their unfulfilled sexual desires. Name withheld, Columbia, Missouri. Okay. I think that there is something to that. Uh, it's not exactly like food. If you never have sex, you are not going to die, but it's not super healthy to not you know, have a sex life at all for most people, some people are asexual, but I am a little appalled that this guy thinks that his right to have sex is more important than bodily autonomy. Oh, that's not the real point. The real point isn't that women have a right to do at, with their bodies as they wish and the victimless nature of the crime. The most important thing is that you want to have sex and you think you deserve it? Uh, no. Th this guy needs a lesson on consent ASAP. That is all I have to say about that. The most important thing in the argument for decriminalization of prostitution is absolutely bodily autonomy. 100%. All right, okay, this is also, I think these are all from uh, Playboy Forum. I'm not your typical National Rifle Association member, nor am I the suburbanite who buys a 45 to protect his home from the imaginary armies of marauding blacks. As a matter of fact, I call myself a socialist, but I agree with those, with those others about one thing, I'm against gun control. I know about the rising crime rate and the gun death rate, but the answer to those problems is to get at the cause of violence in our society, which is socioeconomic inequality. And you'd better believe that if the cops and the army are the only ones with guns, they'll make sure that equality is never achieved. Yes, right there. I've heard it argued that guns would be useless if the government had to be overthrown because modern governments are too powerful to be defeated by people armed with handguns and rifles. Nonsense. I agree. That is nonsense. Determined guerrillas can fight any government, no matter how well armed to a standstill. Look at Vietnam. Right? 
The people who need disarming in this society are the cops, the narcs, the National Guard, and the army. As for me, if gun control becomes a reality, I dare anybody to try to take mine away from me. Molan Lave, right? <laughs> Name withheld by request from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I totally agree with all of that. I also uh, totally believe uh, in uh, self-defense. I am a big proponent for gun rights or women's rights. Uh, you have a gun in your hand, you are as strong as any man. Guns are a great equalizer and I really love them as a feminist for that purpose. Right on. All right. There's an interesting article in here, but I didn't want to dive into it about this guy who I guess is on death row in a non uh, death penalty state. And he was arguing that he wanted to be executed or something. So I just didn't want to dive into that one particularly. The idea of it is very interesting, but I just figured I was kind of pass it over. All right, now we're getting to the good part, the sexy ladies. Artful Bunny. Phoenix Jennifer Edel creates more than a sensation. The secret of life is in art, said Oscar Wilde, and Phoenix-based bunny Jennifer Edel has parlayed cotton tailing and creative ceramic sculpting into a lifestyle that's too good to be kept secret. This is one of, oh, she's a sculptor, and you'll see in here some of the sculptures that she creates. This is one of the most beautiful layouts I have ever seen. It has a very feminine feel to it. This one, too. Really beautiful pictures. Give me something to do and I just do it. I've always wanted to be a famous artist. All right, here is an article called, It's Rough Out There, Gearing Up for Foul Weather and Rugged Going. It's a bit of a fashion spread. I love that one particularly. Look at these guys and the mustache. There's nothing like the 70s for a mustache, huh? <laughs> oh, God. All right, let's see. Ambitious Miss April's Lisa Psalm wants very much to be someone, and she's got hell of a start. She's got a hell of a start. I've wanted to be a playmate for a couple of years, says Lisa. I adore this kind of modeling because I feel good about my body. I love that picture. If you've been reading Playboy regularly, like a good fellow, <laughs> then you already know Lisa Psalm. In February, she appeared in our Playmate Preview pictorial, which gave an early look at some of the girls in contention for Playmatehood. That she made it comes as no surprise to us. Lisa's very, very ambitious, a very, very ambitious young lady. She wants to be a fashion model, high fashion model, a desire probably fostered by her mother, who herself was a professional model and fashion coordinator employed by several modeling schools. Just to give you an idea of Lisa's goal, when we asked her who in the whole world she admired most, her answer was Lauren Hutton. Already a familiar face in San Diego where she's done some local commercials, Lisa just moved to the Big Apple, the big time as far as professional modeling goes. I'll have to look her up and see how she did. I know that unfortunately due to the sex shaming and puritanical nature that America still fosters to this day, 
a lot of girls who appeared in Playboy got somewhat blacklisted, that they dared to be so openly sexual and proud of themselves a lot of people decided that that meant that they were no good and they were just, you know, dirty whores and they could be treated like subhuman. It's a very unfortunate reality, but I think it's incredibly brave of her to go ahead and to show her body and to be proud of it. And, you know, other people can think what they want, but even today, uh, the, the women who pose for Playboy, they will face some form of discrimination and I'm absolutely sure back in the 70s, that was only all the more the reality for these girls. So on a lighter note, I love these illustrations in here. Really, Senator, I'll never get this report typed for the morals subcommittee unless you let me get on with it. Oh, it's true today as it was yesterday and probably a hundred years ago. I think that career politicians are all probably a bit of scumbags. They're all just control freaks. I've never understood, you know, people's desire, whether it's uh, the church ladies or political people or you know nanny laws or this socialist stuff this desire to control other people has never been something that has resonated with me i have always felt like we should live and let live and find the best way to let all of us live and let live you know how what compromises can we come to how can we all work together we're all brothers and sisters i sincerely believe that and this controlling stuff and this you know, dictating to people how they need to live their lives has never resonated with me. And especially the ones who are hypocrites. Why? If that's something you want to do in your life, why don't you, why don't you campaign for the kind of world that you want to live in? It seems so weird to me. I don't, I don't understand politicians. I do not. Oh, we're being so political today. Okay, here's that Girls of the New South uh, article. <laughs> Rip Butler never had it so good. <laughs> oh my gosh. I absolutely love Gone with the Wind. So that is a very great reference. Okay, this girl's hair is the best thing in the 70s. Oh, I die for the hairdos. And, oh, this girl is so I love her. Her name is Jacqueline DeVere of Alexandria, Virginia. She's so gorgeous. All right. Let's see. We are almost done. I, I'll tell you why I close early. That's waiting for me at home. <laughs> they had almost this exact picture. See the sexy lady in the picture? They have almost that exact picture up on the wall in one of the VIP rooms in this club I used to work in called Men's Club in Reno. Oh my gosh, I loved those pictures. I love Men's Club because they have a bunch of, you know, classical, nude, gorgeous pictures like that up over on all the walls. It just has this really classy, really sexy feel to that club. I love it. Highly recommend it. If you're ever in Reno, go to Men's Club. There we go. The Witching Hour. This is in Playboy Potpourri. People, places, objects, and events of interest or amusement. The Witching Hour. This month, Elizabeth Pepper and John Wilcock, the grandfather of the underground press, will once again publish a curious little volume called The Witch's Almanac that's kind of like another world farmer's <laughs> almanac. The price for a copy is $2.50 sent to The Witch's Almanac, blah, 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 addresses. 
This uh, year's issue, we are told, features includes features on giants, mazes, and the worship of the moon. Spooky. Very cool. I think I'm gonna look up the Witch's Almanac and see if I can get a hold of it. Uh, I'm not religious anymore, but I am very spiritual. I think that most religions have really beautiful aspects to them, and I am a proud cherry picker of religion. I love to study religions and to take, to glean the best parts of all of them and create my own personal spirituality from all of them. One of my favorites is Wicca and various different forms of witchcraft and magic work. Uh, I think it's a fantastic idea. I love the idea of the inner self and kind of casting spells on yourself, self-hypnosis, do no harm. I, I, I love it. So that sounds very interesting. I would be looking that up. Incidentally, Marion, since our affair seems to be lasting, I'll need your social security number. <laughs> uh, relationships getting legal status has always seemed like such a funny quirk of fate to me. I've never understood why we're so in love. We need to get the government involved with this. How did that come about? Okay, this is the final one. The final... Uh, interesting thing of our magazine today is this granny she's in a lot of these old magazines are hilarious i love this character and she says promise me you'll be gentle for the free mounting <laughs> that does sound rather like the beginning of a porno i bet you could find a porno in that vein well, that is it for today, friends and neighbors. Thank you very much for stopping by, for listening to my loud mouth opinion, and for enjoying this fantastic uh, vintage Playboy with me. Uh, I will be back again next week, and we will be doing another vintage Playboy, probably from 1977. Again, as you can see, there was no stardust in this particular issue, alas. Uh, but I am still creating that Star Stow video. I keep discovering more and more things. It's promising to be super interesting. And I promise as soon as I get it up, I will send out notifications and everything because I'm super excited about that particular issue. But I like doing all of these. So thank you again so much, friends and neighbors, for stopping by. And I guess I'll catch you on the flip side. <laughs>